Okay, how's the, how's the video recording? Is it a material improvement on the audio? Yes, sir. It is more helpful, right? Okay. So let's uh, now let's just discuss first the schedule for your trading pro your risk management project. Where are we now? Your your uh, exam is on 14th of November. Is that right? Yeah. Your IFM exam is on 14th of November, which means that I'll have to submit the grades by 24th. Okay. So what we are going to do is I'm going to make the uh, the trading project will end on the 23rd. So I have to make sure it's a little bit tight. But anyway, we'll do it. So. By the New York close up, we are trying to operate within we by you know with uh, whole weeks. So the last trading uh, day of the project will be 23rd of uh, November. The New York close of 23rd of November. Okay, those are the prices. If you remember your spreadsheet, quiet guys, be quiet. There's too much talking going on. Sir, are we doing the Doesn't matter. You could be in Ma or you could be going to Mars also. You have to operate. <laughs> you have to run your project. Okay, so uh, your that is your duty to run your project wherever you are. Okay, okay, guys. Now remember the last. Uh, if we just look at the spreadsheet, um, if we look at the spreadsheet here. Then um, under your case, okay. So there is the ending uh, sheet. I'll give you the detailed instructions on. So what will happen is the starting, let's just discuss the starting first. So you have 23rd and today is what? Today is what? 18th, right? 18th October. So we are going to let you, make you start trading. Everybody, is everyone comfortable starting from 22nd? Yes, sir. Live trading will start from 22nd. Bola, the screen in front of you, the computer should be shut down, not just the screen. Do a soft shutdown of the computer. Okay, so 22nd, everyone is comfortable from for live trading. We'll start from 22nd. Okay, so from Monday uh, on Friday, um, uh, over the weekend, I'll update the prices on. This is also something you have to understand when you're managing uh, treasury risk, corporate uh, risk management frameworks. Right, okay, what you have to remember so this is remember this is a starting sheet. So on uh, that 30th September, will now change to. Uh, whatever the Friday is, this tonight's the Friday closing, okay, or the Saturday date or whatever I'll put. So this Friday's date will it will become this Friday's date, and then the prices I will change the prices to whatever is the Friday closings in New York, okay, for uh, at the end of New York trading time, uh, whatever is the Friday closing values, I'll enter those values in the blue cell, the science cells. So now what have ha what happens is this is something else you have to understand when you're managing the underlying position, right? The moment you have a position, there is also the question of, uh, you know, at what price do you have the position, right? Because position can be either long or short. So if you say I'm short dollar yen, then the other question that also arises, the information is not complete. You also need to know at what price are you short, because that makes a big difference. You understand that? Yes. Okay. So that so now these are going to be the prices at which you will be long and short your positions. You already know your underlying positions. Okay, Giri and Akshay. Where is our uh, marks deductor? Sorry, Giri and Akshit. Just deduct marks for Giri and Akshit. Just write down their names. Okay. I don't want to see any talking going on while all these things are being discussed. So is this point clear? Your positions, the information is not complete. Okay. If you're short dollar yen, you have to also tell us at what point. Okay. You're on what uh, using what instrument? Okay. At what rate are you short? Okay. So those Friday closings in New York. Those are going to be the rates at which you're going to have your underlying positions. Okay, you know already. You already know what your underlying positions are: long, short, etc. That we've already discussed. So now you're short and long at these prices from Friday closings in New York. And what will happen is, on that date which we identified on the calendar, which is the 23rd of November, I am going to. So the starting reference U.S. dollar net worth will be calculated based on the prices of the Friday closing in New York, whatever that figure comes out to be. Okay. And that figure will then be used to compare with the closing network, which happens here. Okay. Which is going to be here. And this will be based. This will not be 10th of November. This will actually be what we just decided, which is 23rd of November. Okay. The price will, update will be fixed. One minute. 23rd of November.
okay so obviously these prices are not accurate right now because no one knows what's going to happen on 23rd november but i will that date will now become 23rd november this is the ending sheet okay so and then on 23rd november night i will update the new york closing values and these science cells okay so what will happen is obviously the us dollar net worth is going to be most likely i mean if it happens to be the same that's a huge coincidence okay so we would expect it to be some figure that is different from 48 million okay or 49 million rounded so it will be some figure okay so you underline that and that will give you your underlying position pnl okay so is this clear to you this will happen so you can't do anything about your underlying position okay that remains you have to manage it you have to manage the risk of your underlying position with your shadow hedge book okay is everyone clear about the framework what we discussed any team any doubts okay everyone is clear so underlying position you cannot control and you are just supposed to offset the risks of the underlying position by managing your hedge positions in the hedge book okay so that's what will happen i'll enter the data from 23rd november the prices and you'll get a closing net worth figure and you will have an underlying position pnl which you can't do much about but the key figure is the hedge pnl that 6.7 that is there whatever you make in your hedge pnl on your wanda account that is supposed to offset maybe the losses on the underlying position or if you have profits on the underlying position that is still supposed to maybe enhance the profits okay so you get evaluated on your net pnl okay so in this case we don't really look at the drawdown aspect also that is a, that is also something that could be looked at but to make the project simpler we are not looking at the drawdown aspect we are just going to look at the net pnl which is just adding the underlying to the pnl and the hedge book pnl is everyone clear you add these two and you get the net pnl and then your scores are going to be just tallied the topmost team will get 100% on this 30% weightage and then the last team whatever they get that i will decide based on other subjective criteria whether they get 25 35 45 whatever percent and then the, all the teams in between will get prorated marks just like all your other trading for lab and all that and ifm okay and ipm is this clear okay this is how it's going to work Yes, sir. Use the mic properly. Sir, the profit will not work. Still not work, sir. Our profit has to be higher. I mean, for yeah, obviously, like this team here is showing a net PNL of minus 11.4. So, some team has to use the hedging. Yeah, that's the whole idea, right? That you have to manage the hedge PNL in such a way that you offset whatever is happening on the underlying position, right? So, if the underlying position actually happens to continuously improve. Okay, then the the most skillful team will be essentially what are you doing? How is this book going to be managed? Have I put any constraints on you? Is this going to be? Are you running a? Are you going to be running a active or a passive or a hedge program? Active. Is everyone clear about my question? In this project, what do you what do you think you are going to be doing? Do you are you going to be running? No. I have not given you any instruction saying you are running a passive program. You are actually running an actively managed hedge, hedge program. Okay. So the proper uh, expression would be an actively managed hedge program, but we want to make it shorter so we can say active hedge program, just for the sake of abbreviation. Okay. So everyone understands the difference between the two. Yes. I am sure that everyone doesn't understand, but nobody is moaning. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, it's been discussed in great detail, and I will discuss some more detail about that just now. the sahil asked a very good question yesterday but essentially you are going to be running a uh, you are going to be running an actively managed hedging program in this project okay which means you have the freedom to hedge and unhedge as many times as you want okay but obviously you will face the consequences if you unhedge and then the underlying position becomes even worse in terms of valuation then you are going to be losing money okay at some point you have to cover those you have to eventually hedge and then you'll make a big loss okay so therefore it cuts both ways but you are going to be managing and actively uh, uh, you know the, the the silence is quite deadly actually right now because you have to do a project and you don't seem to be very clear about what has to be done yes okay so let's say like you have a long position in oil what you're going to have to do is okay so this is now This is dollar Swiss. Sir, sir, why can't we trade on in this lab on these computers only, and we get a better understanding? And when you will do there, there will be no problem. No, no, one minute, one minute. First of all, I don't agree that whether you trade on this computer, nobody is stopping you from trading on this computer in the lab. Sir, in the class only. No, no, one minute. We are not going to waste class time 
doing operating activities like entering orders and all that. That is all mechanical stuff. That is not value additive for the use of, I mean, that's not a value additive use of class time. I don't know what your problem is, what you're saying. First of all, your uh, ability to do the project is not affected by where you are using the software. You could be sitting at home, you could be in Ahmedabad, okay, you could be at the airport, or you could be here. It doesn't matter, you are just operating the same software. Are you, are you, are you able to understand why I don't understand your question? <laughs> Okay. Sir, he is saying that we should have more live sessions, you know? No, 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 one sec, one sec. let's be very clear. We are not going to, 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 we are not going to waste class time, one sec. We are not going to waste class time doing, if you have a problem, one sec. If you have a problem operating the software in a particular way, okay, that is okay, you can come to me and ask me a question. But we are not going to waste class time by doing all these stupid mechanical activities like click here and open the order and enter the order. This, if you have any conceptual problem with all this, then you can ask me for uh, clarifications. But we are not going to waste class time doing, because I know what you want to do. You don't want to engage your brain because it's hard work <laughs> trying to wrestle with the concepts. And I can see that most of the concepts that are being taught, people have not internalized. I can see from the quality of the CP answering. Because you're not engaging in the class and you further want to take it easy by doing all this. Uh, this is all stupid clerical work. You're not going to waste class time doing all this stuff. If you have a particular problem with uh, with, a, with a conceptual issue, then we will address that. This is clear. You were also a proponent of live sessions and all that. But that, if you guys want to use the PC for uh, using it, you want to use the lab PC, that you can always come. You can ask me and I'll ask this guy to open the lab and do it. But I don't know how it actually is a value addition relative to your own laptop. How does it, because you're not getting any different software. It's the same software, right? Okay, so if you want to sit in the AC and work it, uh, it's fine, I'll tell them. I can tell you. Uh, okay guys, now that mod is over now. Okay, so now if you are trading, what are you going to do? If you have a, you have an underlying position is long in oil, in crude oil. So if you feel that crude oil prices are actually going to rise from here, obviously what will you do? Yes, Ayush, are you going to buy or sell? Buy. Your underlying position is long. Long. And you, your view on crude oil prices now is? that your crude oil prices are immediately going to turn around and start rising. So what will you do? Will you buy or sell in this project? No, one minute. Let Ayush answer. Not clear. Okay. So what is the answer, guys, in general? Your question to everybody? Yes. No, do nothing. You can't go along. This issue has already been discussed before. You can't go along because what rule will that violate? What is the uh, cardinal principle of hedging with respect to the value of the so net position? Zero and initial underlying position. Yeah. So the net position must always remain. This is a classical principle of hedging that your net position, which is the sum of the underlying position plus the hedge position, must always remain between zero and the amount of the initial underlying position. So if you do what I was just saying, if you buy, then your total position becomes in, uh, goes uh, over the initial underlying position, so it violates that rule. So you can't do that. Okay. So there's a logic behind everything. So if your view is bullish, you don't do anything. You wait. Okay. If your view is bearish, then if you feel it's going to collapse right now, then you would go short. Okay. How much you go short? That's your discretion. That's where the judgment comes in. And that's where the teams are going to differentiate themselves. How good you are at calling the market, okay? At twists and uh, calling the twists and turns of the market, okay? Now, what is the problem here now? You do also now write your own name. <laughs> Don't answer. Don't answer. Don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> write Gaba and Sina. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, guys. Now, one sec. What was I saying? I get uh, distracted. It's a bonded team. It's a bonded Yeah. So this is where you differentiate yourself from the other teams. How much should you hedge? If you feel the prices are bearish now, the outlook is bearish, you can hedge. You would hedge something at least. How much? 10%, 25%, 100%? That's all at your discretion. Okay? That's all at your discretion. So you can uh, do that. That's where the teams will end up differentiating themselves from each other. Okay? And, uh, and then how quickly, how, how, how often you can pick the twists and turns in the market, all right? So that's what's going to happen. And that's what you'll do and eventually you'll have a net hedge PNL, which is going to be shown in your winder account. Please remember that when you start trading on Monday morning, your trading must always be in that particular account. Don't make the mistake of trading in your, you, there should have been no trading. In the, if you see here, I have moved to this account tools. 
uh, under profile no, no, this account account change account I am right now in my primary account which should be used for practice okay you can use it for practice or you can set up another account for practice but there should be a designated account which is IFM September 18 okay you can have a you can have this account name but designated account you should click on this account and switch to that account and all your project trading make sure that when you are doing your project trading this account name is shown over here on top okay this account name is shown on top this is the ID of the uh, account holder and so you make sure that whenever you're doing a project trading the account uh, you're doing it in the correct account okay because the profits and you notice this account is not being touched so when you start trading then your profits and losses will pile up okay and towards the end obviously at the end of the uh, at the end of the trading period you will have to close all your open positions so that everything goes into the cash balance okay on this software this is actually slightly inferior quality software relative to TWS okay it has many flaws but one thing it is uh, one thing it does better than TWS is the charting the charting is much better on this okay so um, the, so this is why uh, this is, and, and uh, you get to because anyway we don't have the option of TWS right now because the problems have not yet been fixed right so uh, at the end I will just look at the cash balance so everything all open positions have to be closed okay so I think this so make sure that you are in the right account okay so I'm not going to send you any special written intimation everyone has to start trading from Monday onwards okay now so what else can more sub accounts and practice in time. you can create more sub accounts but all I need is make sure that I think here there's a limit of 17 to 19 sub accounts okay there's a limit of 17 to 19 we're not sure exactly what it is but make sure that you have at least one account that is free for only your project trading okay and that's the account that uh, of which I will take the submissions okay all right okay so let's uh, okay now I want to discuss something important that uh, Sahil mentioned on the point that we were um, okay, we are going to just um, okay so so point the point that Sahil mentioned a very important question that he asked actually he made two very good points yesterday one one point was uh, that it's, it's captured in our class audio you can cap uh, you can uh, it's captured in the class video so I continued the video recording yesterday but the point he was making is that if you have so I'm not going to address it once again I'm just going to tell you uh, visually I'm just going to tell you uh, orally that uh, the question he was asking is suppose your initial underlying position is a hundred dollars a hundred barrels okay initial underlying position is a hundred barrels but after that uh, and you hedged a hundred barrels okay so initial underlying position is long 100 barrels and you want it to be 100% hedged so you sold 100 barrels okay uh, we are just assuming that you can trade in 100 barrels and on on winder you can okay but in futures markets you can't trade less than 1000 barrels okay but here we're just for the sake of the example we are assuming you can sell 100 barrels so your your net position is then now what now zero zero net position is zero because your underlying long position is 100 barrels and you have a hedge position of short 100 barrels the net position is zero. Now what happens is your sales team, let's say you're dealing with Exxon, uh, you're managing the risk for Exxon Mobil. Now the Exxon Mobil sales team sells, makes a sale. Now this is happening in the underlying business. Okay, this is not a hedge book. The underlying Exxon Mobil sales team makes a sale to Reliance Petro, uh, Petrochemicals of 50 barrels for the month of October 2019, which is where the hedge was for. Okay. So you had sold futures contracts for October 2019. Okay, we assume it can you can deal 100 100 barrels. So now they have made a sale for 50 barrels. Okay. Now what is the underlying position? 50 barrels long. Okay. And what is your hedge position? 100 barrels. So what is the net of the uh, underlying uh, and the hedge position? The head 50 head is 50 short. Okay. And this one is uh, so the net position will be 50 short. Is this correct? Because hedge position was short 100 barrels, underlying position was long 100 barrels, net position was zero. Now 50 barrels of the underlying position has already. So this is how the this is how the position is calculated. Okay, when the underlying business, the sales team of Exxon Mobil, will make a sale of that. They, sale means that they have concluded the price. They have fixed the price. So they make a sale to a, a refinery like Reliance Petrochemicals. Okay, of 50 barrels. Okay, so when this also understand this part that when this happens, 
because you have to understand both the business and the hedging okay so when this happens in the underlying business okay so these guys are just going about their business whether you are hedging or not they would have kept on doing this kind of activity the sales team of exxon mobil okay they have contracted a sale to reliance petrochemical a refinery of 50 barrels which means contracted means price has been fixed okay so now and the position has been sold so the underlying position was long 100 barrels out of which 50 barrels were sold so now the underlying position is down to 50 barrels okay is this clear so your underlying position is now reduced and your so your long 50 barrels and your hedge position is now short 100 barrels so the net position is 50 uh, minus 50 barrels okay does this violate our classical principle yes. what is the classical rule of hedging zero and initial underlying position what was the initial underlying position plus 100 so it is is minus 50 between zero and plus 100 yes, yes. No, sir. No, sir. No, right? So that means you have already violated this rule. So you can't afford to have this kind of a position. So what you have to do is you are forced to do. What are you forced to do now? Unhedge. How much? At least 50 barrels you have to unhedge. Okay. We assume there's no change in the market view. So you have to at least unhedge 50 barrels. Is this clear to everyone? You see this repeated application of the rule. This has to hold at all times. This condition must hold at all times. Is this clear? So therefore, by the mechanical application of the classical principle of hedging with respect to the quantum of the net position, this rule which we are discussing, that is it must be between zero and the initial amount underlying position, this is a rule that applies to the quantum of the net position. Is this clear? So this is the classical principle of hedging as far as it applies to the quantum of the net position. Okay. So if by the mechanical application of this rule, you are now forced to unhedge. 50, 50 barrels on the hedge book. Is this clear? Okay. So Sahil's question was the fact that I am unhedging 50 barrels, does that mean that I am necessarily running an actively managed hedge program? So it's a very good question. Okay. So the answer is no. No, because why no? Because they understand the clear difference between an active program and a passive program. Okay. You are still managing a passive program. Okay. Assuming you don't do any active kind of activities in between. You are you are still managing a passive program because the motivation for okay reducing your the motivation for unhedging because he is suspicious because of the fact that you unhedged and we said that in an active program you would hedge and unhedge so he is becoming suspicious because he sees the team is unhedging so he thinks that they might be running an active program so the answer is no because the reason for the unhedging okay the team had no discretion as to the decision to unhedge they are forced by the mechanical application of this rule. Are you following the logic? Yes, yes. Why did the team unhedge? They did not have any discretion as to whether they should lift the hedge or not to lift, not to lift the hedge. They were forced to lift the hedge to the extent of 50 barrels at least. Okay, because of the mechanical application of the rule that the net position cannot go beyond outside the range of zero to initial underlying position. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. Why did the team have to unhedge? Because of the mechanical application of the rule. It did not, the unhedging did not happen as a result of some uh, application of discretion by the trading team, by the hedging team. This is clear to everybody. You understand what is discretion? Yes. yes. Discretion means when I give the topmost team 100% in the project and then I have the bottom teams, okay, people who don't submit reports properly, they don't submit on time, Okay, what should I give them? I have discretion on that. I can give them 25% also. I can give them 35%, 45%, 55%. Nobody's going to say anything to me on that. Okay, so this is where I have this. This is what it means that uh, to say that you have discretion. Is this clear? So there is no application of, in this unhedging that Sahil has given an example of. There is no application of discretion by the trading team. Do you understand that? Is that everyone clear about that? All. Zombie like responses. Not clear. If you are not clear then say it. No, why do I have to say all this about zombies and all that? Yes. Are you clear about that? Now what is it that is not clear? We are looking at what I am saying is that the discretion, the reason you saw what Sahil is seeing is that the, uh, the hedging team is unhedging the 50, uh, 50 barrels. Okay. So he is suspe suspecting that they may be managing an actively managed trading program. But what I'm saying is it's not an active program necessarily. This alone doesn't make an active program because the reason for the unhedging, you have to look at the reason for the unhedging. I'm coming to the second part. Maybe you wait and see by when you want, once I mention the second part. Okay. 
Here what you have to note is the reason for the unhedging that is that the, not some application of discretion by the trading team. They have no room for discretion here because they are violating the cardinal principle of hedging okay, with respect to the size of the net position. They are forced to unwind. They have no choice. They are required to unwind because if there's a risk manager overseeing their activities, they are going to be forced to unwind. Is everyone clear about this? That they are forced to unwind the hedge position because your uh, 50, 50 barrels of the hedge position because you have already gone outside the rule. Right? So if you see, maybe we can just write this. I don't know why everybody is very quiet. At least Sina has spoken up and said that he is not clear. Okay, so let's say this is the underlying position. Okay. It starts at 100 and then we have sales. Okay. And it starts at 100, then we have sales. Um, okay. Hedge position. Hedge position is also minus 100. Net position is is this clear so far is clear okay now the sales team so now let's have a running total of the um, actually I should make this uh, doesn't matter but I should write this as to be consistent with us so we'll just add the sales will always be minus so 100 plus this okay so okay is everyone following this you have the underlying position which is 100 this is a sales okay we can call this physical sales okay so this is a new topic we are discussing okay underlying position sales cumulative underlying position this is clear if we have another fifty dollars if we have another twenty five dollars of twenty dollars of sales then we have to make this I don't have time to uh, this will be this plus is this clear are you guys following here okay so net position here should always be uh, this and then here we will write net position as um, so instead of writing a here again the net position is um, yeah okay is this clear now with, with an example maybe a little re easier to understand okay but understand the nuances what we are trying to do in this example okay is to understand the nuances between running an active hedging program versus a passive hedging program and it will also help you to understand the fund fundamental rule of hedging as well uh, a little bit better internalize that so underlying position starts at 100 sales team makes a sale of 50 barrels so the underlying position goes the cumulative underlying position goes to 50 at what point at that point what is the net position minus 50 what yes sir okay Chata, are you following clear yeah. okay so now the net position is minus 50 so now minus 50 what is our rule it has to be between 0 and 100 the net position has to be between 0 and 100 okay so you can again write a formula for this if there any the moment, moment the net position goes out of the range it can give you a red warning or whatever you can program that into your spreadsheet that's all your excel programming skills okay so uh, but is this clear to everybody is net position has gone to minus 50 Bola, are you following yes. okay now net position minus 50 what is the cardinal rule with respect to the net position for this case it has to be between zero, to zero and hundred is this clear this has to be between zero and hundred so minus 50 is acceptable or no not, not acceptable okay so we can't have minus 50 so these guys therefore the hedge book the hedge traders have to be the head the heading team has to necessarily buy back 50 50 barrels now are you following this part Sina? the first part they have to buy back because they are already violating the rule the rule says the net position cannot go outside the range of 0 to 100 for this example is this clear so they are forced to violate that they are forced to buy back 50 dollars uh, 50 barrels 
okay, to go back into the uh, 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 within the bounds allowed, they have to buy back 50. At least 50, they have to buy back. Okay, anywhere between 50 to 100, depending on the word. But they are buying back 50 only. So, so the question that Sahil had was now that they are unhedging, does that make this? Does this itself make it a actively managed hedging program? Okay, the answer is not no because the motivation for this. Okay, now double A also. <laughs> Write down double A. Battery has excess charge in the battery. So, okay, all right. Um, okay, so now the motive. What you have to understand is what is the motivation for the hedging team in unwinding this uh, minus fifty dollar position and buying back fifty dollar fifty barrels. What is the motivation? It is not some discretion that they are applying based on the outlook for the oil price. Because they are mechanically following the rule. So it is the mechanical application of the rule that forces them to buy back at least 15 barrels. Okay? It is not some uh, application of discretion with respect to the oil price and the view on the oil price. That's why this is, and I'm coming to the second part. Okay, so this itself will not make it because if you are if you are unwinding based on the mechanical application of the rule alone. Okay, then it is not going to be treated as an actively managed hedge program because you have to remain within the principles, within the rules. This is clear. Now, if you see an active, now distinguish this with a actively managed hedging program. What happens is, okay, in an actively managed hedging program, the guy, let's say the guy has sold at 77. Okay, if he has sold at 77, now when the price comes to 70, he thinks that the price is now going to rise. He is not violating the principle. Uh, he is not violating the principle that, uh, let's say, the net position is such that he is not violating the principle that uh, you know that uh, it has to remain between zero and the initial underlying position. He is not in violation of that principle. But he buys back because he thinks that oil prices are going to rise now. So that's why I, I will get a chance to hedge at a better level because my underlying position is long. So the reason he buys back, the motivation for him to buy back the or unhedge a part of the hedge hedge position, okay? The motivation for unhedging is driven by a view on the oil price, and he has some discretion because no one's going to force him to buy back. If he feels it's going to go up now, then he will buy back. Even if he doesn't buy back, no one will say anything. This is clear. This is this is what is meant by discretion. So there is an application of discretion by the hedging team. Okay, and that is based primarily on the view of the particular market, in this case oil. They have a view that the oil price is going to go up. They are not in violation of the rule. The rule is not forcing them to unwind the position. They have hedged 100 barrels, but here they buy back 50 barrels because they feel that 69.74 is the limit of the downside. Now oil prices are going to turn up and go head straight to 85. So why should they remain unhedged? If they are so confident, why should they remain hedged? Because then they can hedge at 85. Right? They will hedge again at 85. So they buy back at least $50. They have, they have sold 100 barrels. Now they buy back 50 barrels at 69.75 because they feel that this is the limit of the downside. Okay. So this also gives you a flavor for how you will actually manage your hedge book. Remember, because if your if your view now you have hedged at a particular level and prices have fallen, if your view is that the market is going to turn from here and the underlying position is long, then obviously you will unwind the hedge at least to some extent. This is clear now to everyone. Okay, so listen to it again on the video and then you will understand. So that is what differentiates. You have to also look at what is the reason why, what is the reason behind the unwinding of the hedge? Is it the application of discretion by the trading, by the hedging team based on a view of the particular market? Or is it a mechanical application of a rule, of the cardinal rule of uh, hedging with respect to the size of the net position? If it's, a card, if it's the mechanical application of that rule, then it is not by itself, it does not make that act program an actively managed hedge program. Is everyone clear about this? It's a little complicated, but it's a very important point that he brought out. Okay? That will also give you an understanding of the two types of hedging programs. Yes. Application of discretion is here because I, I have hedged. Okay, I have hedged at 77. Okay, let's say we have hedged at 77 right at the peak. We have hedged 100 barrels at 77. Okay. So now our net position is zero. Okay, but now the price has come to 69.80. Now my view is remember the view is also very important. Why have we focused? Why have I focused your this is very unusual in MBA programs that the entire finance electives, if you see, is heavily focused on financial markets. 
because every kind of decision that you have to take as a finance, uh, uh, I mean, uh, working in finance, everything would be based on a market view. Whether or not the treasurer of SNAP, having received a IPO approval before the 2016 election, they have the discretion. The trader, the treasurer of SNAP, had the discretion to launch their IPO before the 2016 election, but he chose to hold on. So that's a market view. The very fact that he chose to hold on when he could have sold his shares before the election, he chose to hold on, that's an application of discretion. That means he had the view that he will get better prices after the election. Okay, turned out to be right, but it was very complicated. Okay, because the rule was that if Trump won, the pocket would crash. And the expectation was, was that Hillary would win. So it worked on both counts and uh, the predictions failed. First of all, Hillary didn't win. And Trump won, and after Trump won, the market actually shot up. But the experts all told you that the market would crash. Okay? All the Nobel Prize winning economists told you that the market would crash. So now you understand discretion. Discretion means you have a choice. Okay? So when you go to lunch, you have discretion. Nobody's going to force you to eat uh, masala dosa or something. Whatever you want to eat, you eat. You have, this is your discretion. Okay? But obviously, if you eat one eye dish, you are pretty much giving up on the other dishes, right? So there is a choice that you are making and you are exercising your discretion. This is clear. So here also the team is exercising discretion. They have hedged 100 barrels at uh, 77. They have gone 100% hedged. Net position is now 0. 69.780. Okay. So the market is now at 69.8. Now the team has a view. So is there any application, is there any uh, violation of the rule? What is the net position now? They have sold, their underlying position is long 100 barrels, okay? And in the hedge position, they have sold 100 barrels at 77. No. So the net position is still zero. Are we violating the rule? No, we are not violating the rule, okay? So if we unhedge 15, if let's say if we at 69.80, okay? Yeah, one minute, let me just finish this example. At 69.80, okay? We are not violating the rule because the net position is zero. Okay. Now at 69.80, suppose I decide as a hedge H team member, I decide let's buy back 50 dollar, 50 dollar barrels. Okay, of the hedge position. So now what will be the new hedge position? From minus 100, the, if I buy back 50 barrels, no, no, 50. Minus 50. The hedge position was minus 100 barrels. I buy back 50 barrels. So now the now hedge position is minus 50. Okay. So what is the net position now? Minus 50. Plus 100 plus minus 50. What is the net position? Zero. Hundred hundred. Plus 50. Okay, let's do it once again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one minute, one minute, guys. Let's do it once more. Net position is zero. Net position is zero. Let's say there is no minus 50 sale. Okay. Now I change the hedge position. I have to put in another column here. Now I have to put cumulative hedge position. Okay, so now what I do is I, no sorry, this should not be, it should be here. Okay, these are hedge transactions, okay. Understand once again the difference between hedge transaction and hedge position, okay. Hedge transaction I do, the hedge transaction I do is um, let's keep it here itself just uh, save me writing formulas okay the hedge transaction that I do is I'm thinking of doing it plus 50 okay actually I shouldn't have written plus 50 the now the net position will be we'll make this um, uh, so I've actually written the formula in the wrong lines but anyway Let's make this. Um, is everyone following what it is? Okay. All right. Now follow this. Okay. So, sorry, I, I wrote it in the wrong. I should have shown the hedge position at. Uh, let's keep one row open for uh, zero. Okay. Let's do it here. 
okay let's do it here as I'm looking at $50 uh, 50 barrels now the cumulative net position is um, hedge transaction okay will be 100 plus this plus this okay okay now one sec now let's be clear initially we had an underlying position of long hundred barrels we have uh, on the head on the hedge book we do a hedge transaction wherein we sell hundred barrels so the net position okay so the hedge transaction is a sale the hedge position the hedge transaction is a sale the hedge position will be short okay so the net position is now zero no okay now the price comes from you already saw the chart i'm not going to show the chart again we can't afford to now with this view so uh, now the prices you hedge let's say you sold the 100 barrels at 77 yes now the price has come to 6980 mm -hmm. you feel that oil prices are going to turn around and start heading back up again mm -hmm. okay the 6980 is the lower limit for oil prices it's going to turn around and rapidly rally to 85 dollars okay so in that if that's your view okay and then also understand how hedging is also driven by a view okay in both uh, instances okay that is so then in this case what you want to do is you want to buy back at least some of your position if not the entire hedge position yes. so what we are contemplating is that uh, this is a, to explain covers uh, to cover the and everybody else the rule application of the rule so first of all notice that the net position being at zero are we violating the rule no because it is between zero and the initial underlying position less than equal to uh, on, on both sides okay uh, less than equal to and more than equal to so uh, now here what I'm contemplating is that I will do a hedge transaction in which I buy 50 barrels okay now what will that do to my cumulative hedge position my cumulative hedge position will now become what plus 50 is that clear that is what we were trying to clear up with in the earlier example that's why I went to the spreadsheet again okay so now is this clear my cumulative hedge position is plus 50 uh, so it's not plus 50 actually this formula is not correct it should be minus 50 one sec the formula is not correct obviously so this Q no, sorry that that the yellow part is wrong I should not have taken yeah this is correct the formula was not correct I was actually writing under cumulative hedge position I was writing the um, the net position formula okay now let's look at the net position the net position should be just the two cumulative positions this plus um, cumulative underlying position okay is this clear this will also give you a way to keep track of your position the net position will always be the sum of the two cumulative positions is clear so here you can see so now the net position is plus 50 is the underlying position is plus 100 and the hedge position is minus 50 it used to be minus 100 but we brought it back by buying back 50 barrels we brought the hedge position back to minus 50 only not minus 100 this is clear the hedge transaction was a purchase of 50 barrels and the hedge position now becomes minus 50 so now the net position is plus 50 okay is this violating the rule no because the rule is 0 to 100 okay so it's not violating the rule okay so therefore now even at 0 the net position is 0 I was not violating the rule so the decision that I took to buy back 50 barrels of the hedge position okay was purely was not I was not forced to do it by the mechanical application of the rule because the rule was not I was not violating the rule okay it was based on a market view and it is a discretionary action taken by the hedging team you could have decided to buy back 10 dollars 10 barrels why 50 barrels you could have bought back 10 barrels you could have bought back 35 barrels 65 barrels 85 barrels whatever you wanted depending on the strength of your market view is this clear so this is how the thing operates and this makes it an actively managed hedge program because this is the action which you have done is based on the exercise of discretion driven by a particular market view with respect to that market is this clear now yes hopefully clearer okay you can replay the video and understand this better now okay it's an important point so uh, I just wanted to dwell on that let's
okay so let's go back to one more point Now we're going to go back to the discussion on um, the decision problems in managing in in hedging uh, passive risk books. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we started the discussion yesterday. So here also Sahil made a good point. I want to dwell a little bit on that as well. Uh, okay, so asset class. Now remember once again the uh, the same decision problems we had discussed in the context of uh, active uh, risk books. What you were doing in IBM, the NSE, uh, the trading that you were doing on the NSE. What was that? An active risk book or a hedge passive risk? Active, 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 active risk book. Why? How would you justify your answer? <coughs> so, so, no, so Goyal's answer is. Uh, my question was active risk book. The answer is correct. But how would you justify the answer? But Goyal is saying that the answer is because we were regularly trading. That's not the correct answer. Sir, what is the correct answer? We didn't have any initial exit position. We were actually entering into a position. Not fully correct. Closer, as we would say in a quiz, you're getting warm, but not the full answer, not the correct answer. Anybody wants to improve on that answer? Yeah. But not to determine the beforehand. In the passive book, we have some. No, 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 no. Yes. Transactions are based on a market view. That is hedging. Also, is the same thing. Hedging is a passive risk book. Okay, guys. Now let me. The answer is. Because Sahil was very close, but because your initial risk, what was your initial position? Zero. You had a million dollars in the account. Is there any market risk on that book? No. If you have a million dollars cash lying in your bank account, there was no market risk. So what is the first transaction? Let's say Tanuj bought Maruti. Then what happens? You added risk. Okay, you bought Maruti just before it dropped. No? <laughs> okay. okay. Now, now the moment you go from a cash balance of one million dollars, there is no risk on that. Then you go and buy common common stock of Maruti. Then what happens? Is there risk on the book now? There is some risk on the book. So what has your first transaction done? It has increased your total risk. Okay. So that's why that's why what you were doing on the NSC is uh, is a rep a represented the management of an active risk book because you are operating as a speculator. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So everything, the answers to everything, there is always a logical answer to everything. You have to understand the logic. The whole point of all this learning in finance is you have to make sure this is what is meant by this is what is meant by understanding concepts. So your your conceptual clarity comes from understanding all these rules. Okay, the logic behind all these aspects. Okay, you don't have to memorize much. If you remember the logic, then you'll be able to answer everything. Okay, is this clear? Okay, and once again, as I said now. For active and passive risk books, and active management versus passive management of a, a hedge book of a, of a, uh, of a hedge portfolio, uh, these are all not very well developed in industry in terms of distinctions. But as you can see, conceptually the distinction is clearly there. Okay, and there are serious ramifications in terms of risk profile because in terms of a, if you are running a passive hedging program, it's much less risky than a actively managed risk for hedge program. In many instances, what I mean, even with publicly traded companies, you'll find that companies don't have clear-cut policies. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing is, it's okay to run a passive hedge risk program, uh, an actively managed hedge program, but you must have a policy, and you must have clearly designated risk capital at the outset, because then you're almost like operating like a speculator to some extent. So you must have a risk capital designation, uh, the limit of your losses, etc. All these things have to be thought through. The point is everything has to be pre-planned and then you just execute the plan. And many companies what happens is they just do whatever happens. Okay, you let's do this. Oh my God, it's losing money. What do we do now? Because they have no plan for that. So you should always have a plan for your downside scenarios. Okay, so that's why you, you never have a surprise. If it's losing a certain amount of money, you already have a plan. I'm going to cut it out. Then you operate. If you don't, if you don't operate like this in the markets, then 
you get decimated sooner or later. Okay, so the market, as you would have already discovered by now, the market is a merciless uh, entity. Okay, it is all powerful and it is no mercy. Okay, so if you don't protect yourself, you will. If you don't take steps to protect yourself, you will get whether you are a company managing risk or an individual speculator or a, a or a hedge fund or a mutual fund, you can get wiped out completely. Okay, so that's the, the rule. So let's come back to these decision problems. In the case of we saw that what we are trying to see now is why did we focus on these decision problems that they exist not only in the case of active uh, you know active risk books but even in the case of passive risk books many of these problems uh, still appear okay some of them are auto so automatically solved and some of them have to be actively solved okay so we are going to see that okay so asset class we already saw yesterday that it is automatically solved because when a moment you look at the balance sheet of magma resources you can see that they have exposure on all these assets. yeah so moment you look at this you can see that they have exposure to certain asset classes you can figure that out so there's no need to take a decision with respect to what asset class are we going to operate it okay okay now um, so now if you see uh, Shivani has already gone oh AC you're switching on the AC <laughs> Switching off. Switching off the AC. No, no, no. no. Go back. <laughs> you, minus. you should get a shawl. All the girls should get shawls. They're always trying to switch off the AC. <laughs> get some kind of shawl or something. Because don't switch off the AC. Okay, guys. Um, now, asset class, come back to the decision problems, okay? Asset class, the decision problem is solved, okay? Uh, as a class, the decision problem is solved. Now the next question is market. Okay, so on this point also, Sahil made a good observation yesterday that I said that the market problem is also automatically solved. But what he's saying is that no, it has to be actively solved because in certain cases you may want to execute your hedge in a market which is different from the market in which you have the underlying position. Is this clear? We gave the example of jet fuel and crude oil, right? You might have an underlying position in uh, in jet fuel as an airline. So we say that. So my first response was that not only is the asset class clear, the asset class is commodities, okay, and the market is also clear. I said that the market is jet fuel, so no, you don't have to decide which market to operate in. Okay. So in response to that, I added an important uh, observation that no, that is not necessarily automatically decided because you may actually sometimes exercise discretion in. Hedging, executing the hedge in a different but related market like crude oil because the jet fuel market is not liquid. Are you following this so far? Okay, so that's a very good observation, but I would still say that the first uh, response in the, on this point will be still that because that actually the decision to hedge in crude, in, in crude oil that's a compromise that you're making because I, you, that still leaves you with some risk. Okay, that still leaves you with some basis risk, which is a spread position or a bet, uh, differential position risk. But it's still some amount of risk, but it's much better than having an outright position. Okay, but it still leaves you with some risk. So the classical answer on this point of as to the question of the market, whether you need to actively decide which market to operate in, the answer again should be that no, it is automatically determined by the market in which you have the underlying position. Okay, but you should qualify that answer by because ideally you would hedge in jet fuel okay and you do get some opportunities to hedge in jet fuel take this example okay there are some otc market players okay remember when you did the hedge in uh, if you're doing a hedge in crude oil futures that would be what kind of market etm or otcm if you are hedging in crude oil futures etm etm right because all futures contracts are exchange traded okay all right so uh, but in this case in the, in the jet fuel you can come from here in the jet fuel market, there are there are some OTC market players, okay, uh, those investment banks which have commodity uh, you know desks and many commodity traders who would offer you jet fuel swaps, okay, that's an instrument that you can use to hedge in jet fuel directly in jet fuel, okay. So the uh, the first step answer should all still be on the question of market. The first step answer is still that it is automatically decided, okay. The decision as to the market, the decision problem is automatically solved. 
but then you can add a qualification that in certain cases people may decide to hedge in a market that is different from the market in which the underlying position is. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. Okay. So you can qualify this answer in, uh, with the second part also. Okay. So the first part will still be that it is automatically solved. Okay. Now let's this one. Instrument that also we discussed in the last class towards the end. So the instrument is again what automatically solved or you have to decide actively? We have to decide. Actively decide. Okay. Because you have, if you can see over there on that screen, we have how many instruments? Cash, spot, okay. So when you are dealing in the physical market, typically it will be a cash market. Uh, we refer to that as a cash market. So cash market, then spot market, futures markets, forwards, swaps, and options. As I said, you can have jet fuel swaps also. You can have options on jet fuel also if some of the OTC players are willing to provide that. So you have a wide range of instruments to choose from. Okay. Although your uh, asset class and market have been fixed. Asset class and market have been fixed, but on the question of instrument, you have discretion. Okay, wherever you want to head, whatever instrument you want to use. So, so the if you look at the answers again, asset class is automatically solved, market is automatically solved, but you qualify it by saying that sometimes the company might want to retain basis risk. Okay, and hedge in a different market. So in that case, they have an active decision to make. On the question of instrument, clearly an active decision to be made. Are you guys following the distinction here? Yes, sir. What we are trying to understand is, if you remember when you looked at the active hedge, active uh, risk books, if you looked at active risk books, all of these decisions had to be actively solved. All these DPs, okay, every single DP had to be actively solved. It so happened that in most, it so happens that in most cases, asset classes, markets, and even instruments sometimes are designated by the investor mandate. Okay, all the way the fund designs itself. Okay, if you are launching a PE fund to invest in real estate, then you as the fund provider have already defined all these things. Okay, you have defined that the the uh, market is going to be real estate. Okay, the asset class is going to be real estate. Okay, so and there are some instrument constraints because in real estate you don't have too many instruments. Okay, so in the case of so everything has to be actively solved in the case of active risk books. Okay. All these, and now we take the same decision problems and we now look at the passive risk books. Okay, and then we want to see how many of these decision problems with respect to passive risk books, how many do we have to actively solve and how many are automatically solved. Is this clear to everyone? Okay, are you seeing the pattern? That is why we are, uh, that is another reason why I say that there is no such thing as a separate IFM and a separate IPM. These are all artificial distinctions. There is a lot of overlap. Okay. There's a lot of overlap between the uh, different uh, subjects, uh, you know, subject matter of these different courses. Okay, so instruments has been covered. Now the question of buy sell, which is one of the most important, or most uh, sort of, which the market considers to be more important. Buy sell decision. What's happening, guys? What do we have to do in the case of a passive risk book? The decision to buy or to sell is it actively solved, or is it? Do we have? Do we have to actively solve it or is it automatically solved? Actively. Some are saying automatic, some are active. Who are the active people? You are all active. Okay. So question is clear. The question is clear. The decision and the answer is also clear. Okay. And here you are saying who is saying automatic? Sahil is saying automatic. So Shah is not sure what he wants to be. The high hand is half raised. Okay. So anybody else on the automatic because the active team is stronger right now. There are more people on the active side. <coughs> okay, so the answer is actually the uh, Sahil is correct. It is automatic. Why? Why, sir? Because, because you already have no interlinking. That's right. That's the correct answer. Because the uh, decision to buy or sell. Remember, we have let's say we freeze all the uh, when we come as we come down the decision problems, we will try to assume that the previous problems have already been solved in a particular manner. Okay, that asset class somebody has already said commodities. Uh, market somebody has already designated the markets okay so when we are looking at the fourth decision problem we will assume that decision dp 1 to 3 is already solved okay that helps us to solve the fourth problem or discuss the fourth problem so now the fourth problem is buy or sell okay so buy or sell with respect to any of the markets that have been discussed before okay so let's take go back to the example of oil okay so the reason sahir is correct and for the reason that uh, akaksha achal is giving that is 
because you are whether to buy or to sell now the question is when you are looking at the crude oil market your question is okay here this is also crude oil when you are looking at the crude oil market one sec if you were a speculator you would have gone either way if you were running a speculative book you would have gone either way if i'm bullish i'll buy if i'm bearish i'll sell okay but now you're not running a speculative book you're running a hedge book okay so you have also to be, you have to be conscious of your underlying position okay so now again your view could be either way the question that we asked ayush earlier okay so ayush again the same question if you are running a hedge book okay and your underlying position is long and your view on the crude oil price is that the market is going up what happened you told me earlier before taking you said you are interested in finance but now what have interest has disappeared in lab you told me that i have interest in finance but i am not getting good marks you forgotten you told me this okay. okay so anyway so if your view now if you're running a hedge book if your view is that the price is uh, the market is bullish and the price is going to just shoot up from here to 85 dollars what would you do buy or sell <laughs> you're running a hedge book and your underlying position is long so then what would you do do nothing but let him answer let's see the answer your situation is you're running a hedge book okay for magma resources your view on the crude oil price on which magma has an underlying long position of a million barrels okay and your view on the oil market is that it's going to just shoot up from here straight to $85 so what will you do as a hedge book uh, book runner okay what will what transaction will you buy or will you sell hold on question is clear yeah. what will you do no, hold on my position you will do nothing right okay so that's the correct answer so you will do nothing because on this you have already got an underlying position if you buy what will happen your total your net position will exceed the initial underlying position so you violate that rule okay so you will do nothing okay so in this case basically what that gives you what what that tells you is okay what that tells you is that uh you got your buy sell decision see remember that buy sell is obviously going to be based on a market view nobody comes and just buys and sells without thinking right they take a, they look at the market they take a view on the market and then they decide whether they want to buy and sell buy or sell okay so here you first you take the market view but now it comes to the question of buy or sell the decision problem is whether to buy or to sell crude oil okay so here one thing is very clear as i shall explain because your underlying position is already long your underlying position is already long and you have a rule that tells you that your net position cannot be in excess uh, outside the range of zero to initial underlying position so therefore that means you are always looking to sell okay okay at least if you, if you if you assume that you are running a passive program let's put some additional constraints if you run assume that you are running a passive risk management program a passive hedging program because you can't unhedge them If you are running a passive, let's put two constraints on this. First, you are running a passive hedge program, which means once you hedge, you can't unhedge. Yes. Okay. Second is uh, you are also going to be whatever you do, you will do for 100% of the exposure. Additional two constraints I am putting in here to make the example to the to make the decision problem very clear, the solution to the decision problem. Is this clear? Two or two additional. You are running an active uh, passive hedging program, and second. whatever transaction you do it you do it for the 100% 100% of the underlying position value okay equivalent position value so 100% okay so if you hedge you will go 100% hedge if you unhedge you will go 100% unhedge and you can't unhedge here okay so in this case with these two constraints okay if now what you're going to do is you are always going to be a seller in the crude oil market if you do anything at all either you will do, do nothing or you will sell is this clear everyone understands the two constraints that i put Yes. that you are running a passive hedge program you cannot unhedge anymore and second more importantly that whatever you do you have to do it for 100% of the position so if you are going to hedge you have to hedge for 100% okay so in this case now do you see that the decision problem of whether to buy or to sell crude oil is automatically solved because it is automatically solved because you have to always sell okay remember we have not yet come to the question of at now we'll come to the next decision problem but is this point clear to everyone yes. that you have to always be a seller yes. because your underlying position is long and you have the golden rule of hedging with respect to the size of the total position 
Is everyone clear? Okay. So that means the bio. So here you see the nuances between uh, one of the reasons I came up with the decision problems is to contrast what happens in an active risk book versus can we sort all the active people from this side? Clear? Okay. All right. Okay. Next problem. What are the next problem? Okay. Let's. We should actually let's deal with entry price first. It's a little easier. Okay. Uh, so this this order, as I said, the order of the problems is not so important. It's more important that you understand all the problems. Okay. Let's deal with entry price. You remember when we were discussing entry price? In the case of a speculator, yes. what kind of things did we discuss? What were the options open to us? One by one, one by one. Yes. Enter the market at the price or or less Yeah. So we discussed three options that now that I've already decided that I'm going to be a seller. Okay, that is my buy sell decision problem is now solved. Okay, automatically solved because I'm going to be a seller. Okay, I have to be a seller. Now what happens is now I have to decide the entry price problem because obviously having decided that I'm going to be a seller, I could sell in many ways. I could sell at the current market, I could sell at a less favorable price or I could sell at a more favorable price. Okay, That's why you come up with the, what are the three orders related to these? Market order, market order, limit order, order, order. order. Market order limit order and stock order. order. Okay, yes. Connected to the, all these three ways of solving the residual problem. Okay, Alright, so now here what is happening in the in the hedging case in the hedging case okay what is happening uh, in terms of uh, the decision problem do we have to actively solve or are they automatically solved no no now we are talking about entry price active now sahil has turned to active anybody here any other view is the question clear the question is with respect to the problem of entry price. Correct. With, uh, <laughs> sorry, one second. Active. 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 No, I'm just repeating the question. Okay. So the question is uh, that with respect to the decision on entry price, because the buy sell decision problem we have already solved. Okay. Now the question of entry price. On the question of entry price, does this decision problem have to be solved actively in the case of a hedger? Or the, the or is it also automatically solved? Actively solved. Okay, it is active because you do have that discretion. You do have that discretion of whether to sell at the current market. We know that you have to sell, but you do have that discretion whether to sell at the current market or to sell at a low, better price or at a worse price. Okay, is this clear? Okay, everyone clear about that. Worst price here would be that if you say that this kind of price here. If you say that now, you see a series of higher highs and higher lows. Okay. Now, uh, Prithi, you can switch off this fan. Now, even I'm feeling poor. So now we can. So I'm sorry that I'm terrorizing you with my uh, teacher's privilege of deciding the temperature. Switch off this fan. Okay. But anyway, so since I'm doing the hardest, the most work in this room, so I, I, my privilege, my preferences should prevail. Okay. Okay, guys. So now, obviously, series of higher highs and higher lows. So if I decide that oil prices are actually very bullish, let's say my view is that uh, oil prices are very bullish and it will go straight to $85. Now where should my stop loss be? Why, guys, please focus. Now again, too much talking. Repeat the question. Now if my view as a hedger, I'm running the hedge book for Magma Resources, my view on the oil price is that oil prices are going to turn around from here and shoot up to eighty dollars. Okay. Now, where should the stop be for my view? Sixty-seven. Why sixty-seven? Yeah, I know there is one there at sixty-seven. Then I'm just ignoring that. Okay, I'm just ignoring that. Then sixty-four point two six. Okay, I agree what Sahil is saying at around sixty-seven ten. There is another low there, but if I ignore that as too small a pattern. Then the answer is 64.26. Everyone is clear about that. Higher highs and higher lows. The uptrend will be destroyed. Okay, you see it has been nicely maintained. Okay, so uptrend, uptrend will be neutralized if it falls below 64.26. So that would be the case. If I am now managing this hedge book and I take this very bullish view on oil and I decide to hedge nothing. Okay, so entire hedge book is 100% unhedged. 
the total position is 100% unhatched or the underlying position is 100% unhatched and then the trigger for me to change and do something to hedge is going to be 6426 okay now that is only one way of taking the view you can take as asai was saying you can look at 6710 also but for the purpose of just to show this example i'm assuming that that's too small a pattern is this clear okay so now this would be how you would so now you see it's actively solved yes. okay so if i decide to leave a stop sell order at 6426 if I leave a stop sell order, remember what order I have to leave? Because I am a seller. I am a seller. So I have to leave a sell stop or a stop sell, whatever you want to call it. Okay? I have to leave a stop sell. If you want, you can leave a stop limit. Sell stop limit you can leave also. This is a form of breakout trade. Okay? Because it's making a new low and you're going short. Okay? Okay, is this clear? Okay. So this everyone is clear about this. I would have to leave a stop sell order. Okay. And in at 6426 okay on a break of 6426 so then on the other side if i if i want to so that means i'm hedging at a price worse than the market because i could have hedged now at 6980 okay but instead of 6980 i'll end up hedging at 6426 that's why it is less favorable than the current market okay and it is being done through a stop order entry price okay less favorable than the current market and done through a stop order is clear okay all right now i could also hedge at market i could also hedge at market 69.80 if i had a bearish view on oil okay and then you could also hedge at a better price if i feel that the oil price will rise again to 75 or something like that i could leave a what kind of order will i leave if i feel that the market will go to 75 and then slowly start to come out what law what uh, order would i leave limit, order. limit so sell limit. sell limit is this clear Okay, people are starting to look bored. Yes. Jayanth is looking bored. Arihan is looking bored. So, sell limit order. Okay, now we wait for Arihan's uh, alarm to go off. Okay, when he goes from looking bored to looking alarming, then we will see. Okay. So you can leave us five minutes. Okay, one minute, one minute, one minute. Let's let's cover the. We have a lot of material to cover. So you can leave us five minutes. One minute. Don't waste time. We don't have enough time. Okay, guys. Position size. You can also put MIT, that's why I gave you the context a little bit in detail. I said it's going to go to 75 and then slowly start declining. So in that case, because slowly start declining, there's no risk of a sharp fall. If you feel it touches 75 and then falls sharply, then you would leave MIT. Because you want to make sure you get out and you're not particular about the price. Here you feel it's going to go up and then start slowly declining, so you're more certain about getting 75. So you place the limit set. Then we have four four options for the problem of interpreters. Three options actually. Why are you saying four? Market Market? Yeah, market interpreters. You can say that it's basically it is basically like a it will function like a same as a the same category as a limit order because it will fall under. It's giving you a more favorable entry price. Okay, in this case. Okay. So it, that's why I said three categories. But you're right. MIT can also be used depending on your market view. Okay. Okay. Position size, guys. What is the binding constraint? Do you remember linear programming binding constraint? Yes, sir. Yeah. So at least she remembers the binding constraint concept in linear programming. If you're making something, let's say you're making something with uh, wheat and sugar. And you have lots of wheat, enough uh, redundant amounts of wheat, but sugar is limited. Then sugar becomes the binding constraint. Okay, so here the binding constraint obviously for you is not, not an exact uh, analogy, but you always have the, the term, in terms of position size, you always have the golden rule of hedging, which is that net position. So you can't if your if your underlying position is plus hundred, you can't go short minus five hundred. You can't go short five hundred. You can only go short hundred. Okay, so there is a limit on your position size. Okay, and within that, now what is the rest of it? Obviously, between zero and hundred. Okay, between selling zero and selling hundred. Okay, if your underlying position is hundred, between that, what will it be? Automatically solved, or you have uh, actively solved? Everybody is now already gone half dead. <laughs> actively solved. Right? Actively solved. Now, Sinha has woken up. Okay, so uh, is this clear? Between 0 and 100, it is actively solved, but there is a limit because you can't go beyond that 0 and 100 limit. Okay? Alright. 
Now we have to put additional constraints because there's too much activity. Like your exams, you know, last 30 minutes you can't go out. So we have to put some kind of restraint like that now. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, so the now units position size, you have decided based on, uh, uh, you have that constraint, so that it has to be actively solved. Okay. Then exit price. Exit price, what will happen? Exit price with loss and exit price. Let's first discuss exit price with prop. In both these cases, what's happened? Let's first discuss exit price with uh, uh, loss. In this case, what happens? Let's look at the situation. The exit price is automatically sold in passive books. In passive risk books, exit price is automatically sold. Yes. Okay. Is everyone in, uh, everybody is everybody already switched off? <laughs> Why is the exit price automatically sold? So because we don't have to uh, get the futures and the contract will be concluded with Yeah. So exit price is automatically solved because if you are managing, let's say you are managing in the case of uh, you are managing a, again now we are talking about a passive risk program. So there will be a difference between a passive hedge program versus an active risk program. Okay. So in the case of an active, uh, in the case of a passive risk program, the exit price with loss will be automatic because you do not unhedge. Okay. So if the hedge position is showing a loss, that means that the underlying position must be showing a profit. profit okay so therefore you will only unwind it where you only exit from the hedge position at a time when the underlying position rolls off okay when you make the sales when you make the sales on the underlying book okay on the underlying position then the underlying position will roll off and then you will unwind the hedge so the exit is not determined by your discretion it is determined by when the underlying position rolls off yeah, underlying. Remember the discussion we had where your sales team in Exxon Mobil, they had an underlying position of 100 barrels long. Then they concluded a sale to Reliance Petrochemicals of, of 50 barrels. So the underlying position became 50 barrels, and then your hedge position was minus 100. So your net position became minus 50. That is not acceptable. So you had to buy back at least 50, right? Immediately, you had to buy it back immediately at the current market. So exit price, we are discussing the decision problem of exit price. So if you are running a passive hedging program, exit price with loss, let's assume there is a loss on this book, okay, on this position. Exit price is not determined by your discretion, it is automatically solved because you have to exit when the underlying position rolls off. So whatever is the market at that time. So it is automatically determined, is this clear? Okay, exit price with profit, again in the case of we are discussing passive hedging programs. Passive hedging program, exit price with profit, what? Automatic. Automatic. Because you don't decide by looking at the market price, oh this looks good, let's get out now. You are forced to exit when the underlying position rolls off, whatever be the market price at that time. Okay, so you have no discretion, it is automatically solved. Okay, in the case of a passive hedging program. Okay, in the case of an active hedging program, what will happen? Exit with profit and exit with loss. What will happen? Both are going to be actively solved because you are now just playing it. Okay, good. Okay, so we've covered all this. Okay, now you're all experts in active uh, hedging program. Okay, go. Yeah. Come on, man. No, attendance, if you want to confirm, you confirm it yourself. I'm not going to confirm, no, you have access to the file. Okay. Does anybody have any technical questions? And I'll keep on. Uh, I'll keep the video recording going before uh, while answering those questions. Anybody has any technical questions? Sahil, Gaba, anybody? <laughs> now the rest of the class can go. But if I'm answering that, okay, I'm going to close the recording then.